Okay, so I hesitated to bring this video forward because I'm not sure what I'm looking at and I, I need your help. So I watched this video uh, just a couple of days ago. It was an interview with Keir Giles. Giles, Giles, I, I'm not sure. Um, now, Keir has written a number of books about Russia. Uh, if you look at his Amazon profile, uh, he spent his career watching, studying, and explaining Russia. His work has appeared in a wide range of academic and military publications across Europe and North America. He's a regular contributor and commentator on Russian affairs. Uh, he's at Chatham House. I mean, there's he's got some, some deep bench kind of background. But he said something that caught my attention because I was thinking along a parallel path, and I'm not sure that I buy exactly what he's saying, but there's something there, and I'm not sure what the something is. So please help me. Okay. This uh, Twitter post, uh, it was posted here, Keir Giles, vital explainer on the personality defects that unite ardent Russian propagandists. Many are convicted sex offenders with a history of failure, misfits who make great targets for spreading vitriol due to extreme personality flaws. Okay, I'm not saying that he's right. I'm not saying that all the Russian proponents or sex offenders or something along these lines. But there's some kind of, when I look at them and just as a group, there seems to be a chip on each shoulder of the most prominent voices. And, and so that's, that's my observation before I was listening to this. Now, I'm also premise, uh, prefacing this because I, I kind of lean toward this being right. So I want, I'm looking for disconfirming information, not confirming information to see if I'm actually right or not. Okay, so we're going to listen to him and see what he has to say here. And then we'll just look at uh, Jackson Hinkle, a little clip by him. And then we'll look at Scott Ritter, a little clip by him, just little clips. And then we'll try to tie it all together. Okay. Let's hear what he has to say. The, the pattern, unfortunately, that seems to underlie a lot of the, the most enthusiastic Russian propagandists is that they have been dealing with severely damaged personalities and personal failure for most of their lives. In fact, the overlap between the number of Russian propagandists who uh, also turn out to be convicted sex offenders is absolutely startling. So now I haven't seen the whole thing or who exactly he's talking about. And it doesn't even have to be just sex offenders. It could be any kind of personality issue or grudge or something along those lines that could be driving that. That was my my assessment before I heard this. And I went, whoa. OK, let's keep going. There are yeah. some deep seated fund first fundamental personality flaws that actually predispose people to being. Uh, available to be made use of by Russia. And if you look back at the, the KGB handbooks for recruiting agents of influence, agents of subversion, or indeed propagandists, then you can see very clearly that Russia understood the misfits make the good targets, the people with a grudge, the people who feel they've been treated unfairly by the world because they've been consistent failures. And so if you go back and you look at my videos about, uh, particularly about Scott Ritter, like he has, like I showed you Biden chastising him like 20 years ago in before Congress or 30 years ago before Congress. And uh, Doug McGregor is Colonel Doug McGregor. And he's kind of got a chip on his shoulder about not being a general. He talks smack about uh, American generals all the time. Like, oh, they don't know what they're doing, but he does. Jackson Hinkle, young guy that still has this um, outsized chip on his shoulder as well. It's really interesting to watch. And therefore seek revenge. And because, you can see that revenge coming through so strongly in some of the, the verbal attacks that you hear from the trolls, from the so-called independent journalists, the ones pushing the Russian propaganda lines. Because the bile and the vitriol and the hatred that they pour out when they're talking about people who criticize Russia Mm -hmm. It's extremely personal and it's plainly deep, tapping deeply into their own personality defects. Okay. So I don't know if that's the case or not. I'm not a psychologist, but there's something there. I, I just, I can't tell you exactly what it is. Let's watch Jackson Hinkle's latest. Let's just, this was Red Square. He went to go visit Moscow. Well, because Russia's so dreamy. Here we are. And we'll let's just stop periodically, but hear what he has to say. Now, he has some music going on here, so I'm not going to play that with the music. You can just watch him walk around uh, for copyright. All right, we're here. Red Square, Krasnaya Ploshit, with the big old Loshit. You see it up there? I made a joke. All right, so this is absolutely beautiful. As you can see, 
I'm going to be honest. America's got nothing like this. This is amazing. Now, isn't that interesting? Now, so part of my observation is that there, there's really like a, a chip on the shoulder about how America is inferior to Russia from most of these kinds of characters. And like, there's nothing wrong with him particularly liking another country. Maybe his sense of understanding if he's liking Russia with what Russia's doing is questionable, but let's say. So I, I'm not saying he has to be America first or right or wrong. I'm not saying that at all. But he really deeply loves Russia here, it seems. Now, it doesn't hurt that his girlfriend or fiance or whatever is Russian. That's part playing into it as well, as is Scott Witter, Ritter's wife, who was who he met when it was the Soviet Union, who was from the former Soviet Union. That could be influencing it as well. I'm not sure exactly, but there's something here and I, I can't quite figure it out. So, all right, here's my fun fact about uh, Krasnaya Ploshe. It was originally an old Russian, Krasny means beautiful. So it was called Krasny Ploshet, which meant beautiful square. The word has, was used to describe the square before the 18th century to the late 19th century. Several of the main squares in Russian cities were called Krasnaya Ploshet or beautiful square in English. Krasnaya now means red in New Russian. The red square originally described the small area between St. Basil's Cathedral and Spaskaya Tower of the Kremlin. So it wasn't even called. Okay, so there's nothing wrong with having a fun history fact. Okay, but he really, really, really likes Russia. In spite of what Russia is doing. In fact, maybe even because of what Russia is doing. And he identifies with it very strongly. Um, so let's keep going. Red square. It was called Beautiful Square. So the cathedral over here, apparently he, it was such a beautiful creation that they blinded him after the guy who uh, was the architect and built the cathedral because they didn't want anyone to ever build anything this beautiful again. And uh, so they- wait, 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 they blinded the architect because they didn't want him to ever make anything that beautiful again. And he's like, cool with that story? Like, if I was telling that story, I'd be like, not a, not probably the best plan here, but he's like, yeah, that's what happened. Actually blinded him after he built the, after he built the cathedral. Russia truly is the paradise. You don't have blue hair freaks serving you coffee at 7 a.m. You got, who do you got here serving yeah, you coffee? Yeah, but, but it's closed. Wow. As you can see, it's closed. So they have robots. So Russia is the paradise. You don't have freaks serving with blue hair serving you at seven in the morning. You have robots. Notice how enthusiastic he is. Serving coffee now. This is incredible. And hot chocolate and, and like hot chocolate. Let me give you my honest thoughts on what I think about Russia so far. For starters, everything in Moscow, we haven't even been to St. Petersburg. You compare Moscow to New York, Miami, Los Angeles, I mean, London. It is fancy schmancy here. This place is amazing. Service is top tier. Food is top tier. Inf it's fancy schmancy and everything is top tier. Huh. Okay. Well, let's keep hearing. Infrastructure is top tier. There's no homeless meth head tweakers on the streets trying to attack you for simply breathing. It is absolutely incredible. And uh, really, the infrastructure is really great. It's clean. I love it so far. And I think it's only going to get better as we see more and more. And uh, there's the future Z army. Anyways, I did you hear that? The future Z army as this little kid walked past. That that was his comment. As this, let me play it again. And uh, there's the future Z army. Anyways, I just love it. Like he just loves it. And there's no crime. That's because the government has a monopoly on crime. So it's a little different there. I, I experienced that when I was in Belarus, how it was it was like eerily not crime. Not unless you were part of the mafia government conspiracy that is the crime that will not, not allow other crime. Okay. The food's been great. Music. I went and saw the opera last night. That was, yeah, that was but, crazy. But, but. Let's be fair. Let's be fair. We stopped in the center of Moscow. We stopped near the Kremlin. We have like the best apartment for probably like thousand dollar per week, and we have like everything the best. So okay, so go to the best. Go to go to New York or go to Los Angeles though, and 
It's terrible infrastructure, homeless tweakers trying to kill you, and robbers and thugs on the streets, and the infrastructure is lacking, and like you got the sidewalks falling down right before your very eyes. Okay. So I, I'm agreeing that we should clean up crime where we have crime and not tolerate crime. And that's that's not a problem. But to compare Moscow and say, well, this is great, not realizing the unseen crime, governmental mafia-like crime that's there. And by the way, who's this guy that keeps following him all around? I just, I don't understand that. Anyway, let's keep going. Okay, I get we're in a nice area. Compare that to America or London. You can't compare. I mean, and, and you can also compare to Dubai. Dubai doesn't have the history. I say Moscow wins, but we're about to go to St. Petersburg, so I think St. Petersburg is about to win. Anyways, I love it here. It's great. I highly recommend, if you have the means, come out, you know. Getting a Russian visa is very easy. It takes uh, like eight days to fulfill it, you'll know. And uh, trips out here aren't that expensive. No, they're not expensive because the ruble, the dollar to the ruble, and the ruble has dropped like a lead rock. I mean, it's gone plummeting, so it should be extra cheap right now. Cost of living out here is not that high. Well, as long as you have your American income, if you have their income, it's a very different picture. And uh, I highly recommend it. Okay, so that was really bizarre. But he really, really loves Russia. Again, there's nothing wrong with necessarily loving another country. But this is one of the most pro-Russian commentators, and this is where he comes from. Here's uh, Scott Ritter just talking about the dynamics on the ground and what he sees when you know, the lay of the battlefield and that kind of thing. Look how he talks about Russia as he speaks. I'm going to just let him speak for like three minutes. I'd say that Russia is closer to achieving its objectives than Ukraine is to achieving its objectives, uh, which tells me Russia has the momentum, Russia has the initiative, and Russia has realistic objectives that can be attained. Um, okay, so this was a while back, just in all fairness, this was, this was a, uh, I just pulled up any random Scott Ritter something. Uh, this was 10 months ago. So I, I'm not going to fight with him about what, what his perspective is, even though he was wrong then, and he's continuing to be wrong. Just listen to the way that he talks about Russia. Ukraine doesn't. I mean, there's just literally no one on this planet besides maybe, um, I don't even think the Ukrainians believe it, that they're going to recapture uh, the Donbass, that they're going to recapture Kherson, Zaporizhia, that they're going to recapture Crimea. Uh, this is fantasy. So you have one side that's um, that their objectives are fantasy-based. You have another side whose objectives are, while difficult to achieve, are very realistic. Um so I'll go with the realistic side over the fantasy side as to who I think is going to prevail. Then we take a look at capabilities. For certain, Ukraine had a good September. There's no one that's going to debate that issue whatsoever. Uh, but at what cost? And what I mean by that is in order to achieve this good September, Ukraine had to absorb um, billions, tens of billions of dollars worth of NATO equipment. It took months to do this. It took months to get people trained on this, to bring the equipment in to match the equipment with the people, organize it, and bring it to the battlefield. And then in one month, Ukraine pretty much burned through everything. The cash well, not exactly. It's about a year later because it's September a year later, and that's not exactly the case. But just, again, listen for how he's talking about Ukraine in one, one light and Russia in another. The least they've suffered have been horrific. They've lost the equipment. They've lost most of the manpower. Um, and they're down to a position now where they're begging the West to help them reconstitute this capability. Russia started September with pretty much the same force structure that it brought in when it invaded in, in, in February. Uh, and what had happened is uh, Russia pretty much had insufficient resources to the task they had set forth for themselves. Uh, they had many parts of the defensive line that were stretched thin. And the Ukrainians were able to exploit this, and the Russians wisely, I believe, uh, traded territory for lives. Uh, the Russians aren't in the business of just throwing away Russian lives. Well, maybe they kind of are when you look at the big picture, but I'm not going to quibble with that. Right so now. they weren't going to hold on to a strong point and defend it to the last man. Uh, they were more than happy to withdraw, trade territory, save lives, consolidate their defensive positions, all the while inflicting what 
should have been prohibitive casualties on the Ukrainians. Tens now, of now, what ironically, this video that I pulled randomly, if you listen to what he just said, this is exactly the opposite of what the Russians just did in the last few days uh, in Zaporizhia. And I just talked about that in my very last video, uh, ironically. Of thousands of, of losses. Um, meanwhile, while Russia is consolidating their lines, they're reinforcing. Vladimir Putin ordered the partial mobilization. 300,000 uh, reservists have been called up. 87,000 of them are currently deployed into the special military operations zone. The rest... Again, remember, this is an old video. This is last year. But just hear how he's talking about Russia. finalizing their organization into fresh combat units, which will give the Russians tremendous flexibility and operational capacity. So as Ukraine is shrinking its combat capability, Russia is increasing its combat capability. And then we take a look at strategic aspects of this conflict. I think the West made a mistake in um, misinterpreting Russia's soft approach to the special military operation, going in with fewer numbers than mo many people thought was necessary, and going in softer, not doctrinally, not... Russia's soft approach. They had 180,000 invading Ukraine that was unprepared for it. Where was a soft approach? But listen, Russia's a, just a cuddly teddy bear. And, you know, now they're taking the gloves off. Using overwhelming firepower, not rolling through. Um, in effect, trying to reduce civilian casualties and damage to civilian infrastructure. While the reduction of civilian casualties continues to be an objective of Russia, uh, the day and age of saying we don't want to harm civilian infrastructure is over. Russia has taken the gloves off there and has shown that it can close down Ukraine as a modern nation state anytime it wants to. But it doesn't want to a year later. But, but again, my point was, listen to how he talks about Russia. It's in these glowing terms like he loves it. Doug McGregor is another one. Here's here's Douglas McGregor. I'm not going to show him actually speaking, but like he's another one that's constantly talking about Russia. He he seems to identify more with Russia than with the United States, which is really interesting. And he has nothing good to say about American generals. OK, so. I think there's something there. I'm not sure that I fully agree with Kier, but let's just listen to Kier one more time to have his assessment. And then I want to know from you, what do you think about this? Is he on track? Is there, am, what am I missing? I, just one more time, let's listen to him. Question. The, the pattern, unfortunately, that seems to underlie a lot of the, the most enthusiastic Russian propagandists is that they have been dealing with severely damaged personalities and personal failure for most of their lives. In fact, the overlap between the number of Russian propagandists who uh, also turn out to be convicted sex offenders is absolutely startling. There are yeah. some deep-seated fund first fundamental personality flaws that actually predispose people to being uh, available to be made use of by Russia. And if you look back at the, the KGB handbooks for recruiting agents of influence, agents of subversion, or indeed propagandists, then you can see very clearly that Russia understood the misfits make the good targets. The people. Okay, if anybody knows more about this and can point me to something, I'd really appreciate it because I, I'm really just trying to wrap my mind around this and understand this. I'm not making his claim. I just. There's something here, and I'm not saying it's sexual. It, it could very well be something just, you know, I, I like to have my 15 minutes of fame. It could it could be that that simple. I don't detect this on the other side. I look at a Vlad Vexler or an Anna from Ukraine or a Jake Bro or these kind of figures on the Ukrainian side, and they seem a lot more balanced and less hateful. Like, it's just like there's like a, a real grievance spilling through with the words that are said on the other side. And I, I don't see it the same way. Um, and, and maybe I'm just blind to that. That, that is a, a legitimate possibility. But help me understand what I'm not seeing a little bit more. With a grudge, the people who feel they've been treated unfairly by the world because they've been consistent failures and therefore seek revenge. And you can see that revenge coming through so strongly in some of the the verbal attacks that you hear from the trolls, from the so-called independent journalists, the ones pushing the Russian propaganda lines, because the bile and the vitriol and the hatred that they pour out when they're talking about people who criticize Russia, it's extremely mm -hmm. personal and it's plainly deep tapping deeply into their own personality defects. And, and, and that's my observation as well. 
I could be completely wrong. This is the furthest out on a limb that I've ever been in any video. And I'm, I'm not saying that he is right. I am saying I think there is something there, but I, I'm not sure what I'm seeing exactly. So if you have some insight and you can put that into the comments below, please help us, inform us, provide links if there's something there. Thank you for listening to this. Thank you for the likes, the shares, the subscribes, the coffees, and thank you for being the kind of person that cares about Ukraine. I'll be back tomorrow, and I hope you will be too.